uh, coming in late. Welcome to everyone joining us uh, on the web stream. Uh, my name is Adrian Monk from the World Economic Forum, and this is a press conference to launch our Global Risks Report for 2018. I'm joined here with uh, our panelists, my colleague Margareta Drenyuk-Kanuz, who is going to be explaining some of the key points of this year's report by two of our partners in producing the report from Marsh and Zurich Insurance Group, John Drizik, who's president of Global Risk and Digital at Marsh, Alison Martin, who's the group chief risk officer at Zurich Insurance, and also by my colleague, Rick Sammons, who is responsible for taking all of the insights in the Global Risk Report and transferring them into something meaningful at our annual meeting, which is days away. So, Thanks also to our kind hosts at uh, Bloomberg for having us in their lovely new building. One of the risks that we haven't mentioned in this year's report is spilling coffee, red wine, or anything else on their lovely upholstery. Uh, I trust no one has uh, snuck in a cup of tea that they're going to be uh, waving around uh, to ruin the look of this uh, lovely room. Um, I'm going to start by asking Margreta just take us through some of the key highlights. And because another risk I hadn't identified was of me sitting in front of all of the highlights as they come through, I'm going to drag my chair to one side uh, in a good old fashioned way and let Margreta take you through the report. Thank you, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. And it's great here to present the 2018. Uh, global Risks Report, as has been a tradition in the past uh, past years. I'm going to take you through some of the main results um, of the of the, this year's Global Risks Report, hi highlighting high-level findings before we delve into the details, um, which are going to be presented by the other panelists. So, and of course, it doesn't work. Okay. So this year um, actually focuses on four key topics, and these are these are um, important because they've been building up over the past years, but obviously they came up very strongly. First of all, the environment, and I'm going to talk, talk about this a little bit more. Cybersecurity, which has been building up also in the past year. We had a number of cyber attacks, and it's been gaining in prominence. Um, economics, where we see an interesting story because the risks are reduced this year. We see a l l less of a probability likelihood and less of a potential impact of economic risk. At the same time, the trends speak against this assessment. And then also geopolitics, which has been obviously on everybody's mind over the past um, of the past years. The, I think what's challenging about this year this year's uh, risks report and the situation we are currently in is that there are a number of factors that make it very hard to to, to act about those risks and that make actually those risks significantly stronger than we saw it in the in the previous years. And we um, I think what's what's coming together is that the pace of change has been accelerating. Uh, and also that the interconnections between those risks have been accelerating. This is something we've seen over the past years. At the same time, many of those risks are increasingly systemic in nature, and this is also not new, but I think as we advance and as this process continues, we're increasingly reaching tipping points across a number of systems that could really bring the systems to a brink and that could have um, potentially systemic and catastrophic consequences for humanity and for the economy um, as a whole. So examples of this um, cyber attacks, for example, last year have, uh, have spread across um, not, have not just impacted the corporate sector, but also spread into the governments, have affected infrastructure as well, which is a novelty in terms of um, you know, the long-term development in this, in this space. But also it spills over into the geopolitical sphere and into affecting economies and societies in an entirely different, different way. Um, we see at the same time, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this news, the global economy has been picking up. Uh, this could lead to complacency about many of those risks. Um, at the same time, this is a great opportunity to act on many of those risks because there's a cushion, there's a window of opportunity that, uh, that leaders can, can, and you cannot see this here, of course, because I'm sitting in front of it, but that leaders can take advantage of, um, of this current upswing in order to address many of those risks and start investing into, into um, you know, different systems in terms of environmental, um, environmental addressing the environment, uh, environmental challenges, addressing some of the economic challenges. This is a global risks map, and if you've been here in the past years, you know, you know it has been, we've been publishing this for a number of years. It shows impact and likelihood of the third year risk that we assess. Um, this year, what's, what's striking is that actually the economic, the environmental risk, they are, all of them are in the top upper, uh, upper right quadrant, so they're considered as highly likely and potentially very impactful. And this is a new finding this year. Uh, they, they were moving up into this direction over the past years, but in particular in terms of extreme weather events, natural disasters, failure of climate change, mitigation, adaptation. So a lot of the climate change related risks are really up there in the upper right quadrant, considered highly impactful and highly, um, highly likely. 
um, but also biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. And here in particular, we've seen you know, the, 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 the numbers and the underlying data is really, is really scary and is, is very concerning. We see um, over the past 27 years, only in Germany, 75% loss of insect populations. Uh, that are really important for the systemic nature of the of biodiversity of the ecos of the ecosystems. Um, we also see increased man-made environmental disasters, increased concern about man-made environmental disasters at this at the same time. In terms of climate change mitigation adaptation, 2017 again one of the most one of the three hottest years on record. The temperatures continues to rise, um, and we we do not have solutions in place in order to address uh, those. This is becoming increasingly increasingly clear. The second set of risks that we look at, the economic risks. And actually, when you look at the map, the economic risks, they losing slightly in importance in terms of impact and likelihood. However, the data tells us a different story. So this may be influenced to some extent by the fact that the economy has been picking up and we just tend to see the positive <coughs> side of the picture rather than the negative side. But we also see that there's a lot of um, uh, debt that's been building up, uh, especially in, in, in Asia and China, but also in, across the G20 economies since 2007 and actually doubled in terms of the debt. And already in 2007, we were worried about the debt. Uh, we see that inequality is still a persistent issue. 53% of the countries, according to the IMF, have increased inequality over the past 30 years. So it's an issue that, and, and actually in our own inclusive development index that we'll be launching next week, we see that um, the countries have not advanced in terms of addressing inequality, despite, despite progress on economic growth. Um, then last but not least, there is one particular set of risks that is, that is depicted by this dot that is really um, important. Cyber attacks are moving up very strongly. Certainly also the result influenced by the events of the past year, of the last year. We had Petya, not Petya, wanna cry, that have affected the corporate sector. But it also spilled over into infrastructure, into government, um, into government um, operations as well. And that affecting society and economy in entirely new ways and in much more broader ways. When we move to the next slide, and this is the interconnection map. Uh, that we see here. And by the way, this data is based on a survey that we run every year, approximately um, August to September, um, of our communities, about 1,000 respondents across the World Economic Forum communities. So we see here that um, the concerns really persist, and this is very, very clear out of this, uh, this, uh, this interconnections map, about whether the economic model really contributes to society. The interconnection between unemployment and unemployment and profound social instability has been very strong for the past years. It's been one of our key messages in the past years. And this year, what's particularly interesting is that it's, um, in, uh, it's augmented by this or, you know, triangulated together with um, adverse consequences of net technological advances. So the respondents clearly see this connection between unemployment and underemployment and um, adverse consequences between technological advances as it could amplify the societal issues that we are already facing today as a result of an, of an economic model that just did not contribute right now to the rise of living standards and that is, has been perpetuating inequality and has been not translating into, into wage growth over the past years. And then last but not least, we also asked the respondents this year about what are their risk trajectories, what, what do they foresee as the risk trajectories in 2018? And actually here, the results are very striking. First of all, 59% of the respondents think that we'll have a higher risk in general or, or, or a more dangerous risk landscape in 2018 than in previous years. So they see 2018 really as, as, as a year where risk is increasing. But at the same time, when, and we asked them across a range of, of, of risks, the ones that came on top were really related to geopolitical uh, developments. So political economic confrontations, state on state military conflict, regional conflict drawing in major powers. These are the top three and really the top one. So econo political economic confrontations, 93% um, of the respondents thinks that um, they will increase uh, or, or significantly increase, somewhat increase or significantly increase. You can see this unfortunately here um, in, the, in the coming year. So there's a significant concern that persists about the geopolitical risk going for the coming year. Thank you. Margreta, thank you. And I'm going to shuffle myself neatly back. You won't even notice I'm so good at it. Um, you saw cyber attack up there as one of the, uh, one of the risks that's made it into the upper quadrant. Um, I'm going to ask John to just take us through a little bit of a deeper dive on what some of that means and uh, what the consequences of it are. John. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, as Margaret has said, as we enter 2018, there's a, a positive outlook for the global economy, and uh, we see global growth forecast is up, um, stronger business confidence. Uh, however, this is no time for complacency. 
I think as you've seen with the risk outline uh, that Margareta uh, presented, uh, this is a very positive operating and investment uh, environment uh, for businesses and a wide array of risks uh, that they're facing in the coming year uh, that could create shocks to, uh, uh, to their businesses. So premium on resilience in the strategy. And before I turn to cyber and focus on that, <clears throat> and just one statistic which I think summarizes the accelerating change in the environment is the length of time uh, companies uh, spend in the S&P 500. If you look at that lifespan stat, in the 1950s, companies spent about 60 years on average in the S&P 500. As of now, it's about 12 years. I think if you look at the forward environment, both the opportunity side and the risk side uh, suggest that will continue to shorten and there's certainly gonna be pressure uh, to remain at the top of uh, the league tables. So with that in mind, let me turn and focus on cyber risk, which I think is an area where I think some of the threads in the global risk environment come together. Um, and also cyber was very prominent in this year's global risk report surveys. Uh, it was the number one risk uh, across the business uh, leadership that responded to our executive survey in uh, advanced economies. Uh, risk, it was also uh, noted as the risk most likely to get worse in 2018, to intensify in 2018 in the overall global risk uh, perception survey. So why is cyber coming into focus? Obviously there's been a lot of attacks in 2017 with wanna cry, pet ya, not pet ya. But looking forward, the scale and sophistication of attacks is going to grow. Uh, and fueled in part by some of the geopolitical trends that uh, Margareta highlighted, uh, where, which could lead to more state-sponsored attacks to add to the financially motivated attacks that are already out there. At the same time as this increasing uh, suite of attackers, you have cyber risk growing, or cyber exposure growing, in companies. Uh, think about the proliferation of uh, interconnected devices. Uh, there's currently today 8.4 billion of those out there, so already greater than the global population of 7.6 billion, and projected to grow to 20 billion in 2020. So that just widens the attack service surface uh, for companies uh, uh, to potential attacks. Uh, the use of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies is also leading to greater cyber exposure for companies. So I think, you know, looking forward, uh, both business and government need to think about increasing investment uh, in cyber risk management. So even as this risk has become more visible, I think we're still under-resourced in the amount of effort being put into trying to mitigate this, uh, this risk. And just as a point of comparison, I thought I'd compare the scale of uh, cyber risk to something that perhaps is more familiar in terms of its numbers, uh, which is the damages from extreme weather events or natural catastrophes. And so to compare the degree of economic cost, uh, the estimates now are that uh, if the attacker took down a major cloud provider, the damages could be 50 to 120 billion. So something in the range of a, a Sandy event to a Katrina event. The aggregate cost of cyber is now estimated in a number of sources at more than a trillion dollars uh, per year of economic cost uh, versus the roughly 300 billion experienced in 2017 from losses to natural catastrophes, and that was a, that was a record year. So you think about the comparative scale. Cyber is at or above the scale of uh, natural catastrophes, and yet the comparative infrastructure against it I think is much smaller in scale. Uh, think about the government agencies as well as uh, voluntary organizations that focus on response to natural disasters versus natural cyber agent, national cyber agencies are much less resourced. They have some capacity, but, but not enough to deal with what is a uh, significantly growing risk. Also, international protocols uh, have yet to really emerge in dealing with cyber risk, and those are going to be needed as well. And in the geopolitical climate we're in, it's harder to get to multilateral agreements. So all of this, I think, paints a challenging picture for uh, the defense against cyber risk. From a business standpoint, there also, I think, needs to be more focus on response in addition to prevention. Again, comparing to natural catastrophes, most businesses 
that live in that are or that are based in uh, uh, NAPCAT prone zones mm -hmm. have very extensive business continuity plans to respond to that type of emergency. Uh, only about one third of companies have a cyber incident response plan to respond to a major attack. So again, by comparison, we're under resourced against cyber. And I think this the growing potential gap between the economic losses that uh, could be occurred and the insured losses, and you think about that protection gap in the context of natural catastrophes, again, was very big in 2017, uh, could be even bigger uh, for cyber. So, uh, so cyber risk, I wanted to draw attention to in this specifics, but again, coming back to my opening comment, I think this is an environment in general where businesses could face a wide number of shocks, cyber and beyond cyber. And as Margareta pointed out, the economic risk in this environment is, is not decreasing. We have uh, debt equity ratios in the corporate sphere that are double what they were in 2010. So businesses are more vulnerable to these types of shocks, cyber and otherwise. And it presents a very uh, challenging environment. So plans need to go after the growth opportunity present in the global growth <coughs> outlook, but at the same time look to build resilience. John, thanks very much. And uh, Alice, I'm going to turn to you. I think everyone uh, noticed that uh, all of the risks in the, in the top half are almost all environmental. And you're going to tell us a bit more about those. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. So I'm an optimist by nature, and I do still find things to be optimistic about. We live in an unprecedented era of technological, scientific, and financial resources. We see great innovations, gene editing techniques possible could cure blindness, be a radical solution to the terrifying prospect of antimicrobial resistance. Yet, the risks to the world, as you've seen, are increasing. They're not reducing. They're systemic in nature, and they require collective will. This comes at a time of rising nationalism, populism, and protectionism and a decline and a retreat from the kind of rules-based multilateralism that will be so important. I fear that we may squander the opportunity we have to build a more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable future. And as a leader in business, as a member of our society, and as a parent, I do worry about what future we're shaping for the generations to come. We can make a difference, but we need to act. An area of particular concern is the environment. And as you've, you've seen, all five environmental risks have grown in prominence over the 13-year history of the Global Risks Report. There are a number of areas of particular focus and concern. These are rising temperatures and extreme weather events, loss of biodiversity, pollution of our air, land, and sea, adaptation or failure to adapt to climate change and its mitigation, and then the transition risks that will come with that mitigation. It's not surprising that extreme weather events rank as the number one risk on likelihood and impact. September 2017 was the worst, most intense month on record for natural catastrophes. And as, you, and as John said, we've seen more than $300 billion of economic losses in the North Atlantic hurricane season. And it wasn't just US and Caribbean. Ireland saw their worst storm in more than 50 years last year. Extreme temperatures have also reached new record highs. So in fact, last year was the hottest El Nino year on record, and that now the second hottest year in aggregate. As a consequence, we saw lots of wildfires last year in many countries. So US, Chile, Portugal, a lot of economic costs, but sadly also more than 100 deaths in Portugal alone. It's important to note rising temperatures are a risk for our agricultural systems. We see now that there's a 5% probability in any decade that we could have a catastrophic, simultaneous failure of the US and China's maize production, which together account for more than 60% of global supply. Over the last decades, we've seen a drastic loss in biodiversity caused by human destruction of habitat, raising fears of an ecological Armageddon. And if we look at pollution, indoor and outdoor pollution now accounts for one in 10 deaths globally. More than 90% of the world's population live in conditions and pollution levels that exceed the World Health Organization's recommendations. And as we move to more megacities, this trend will only increase. 
The emissions of CO2, unfortunately, last year increased for the first time in four years. And rising temperatures combined with extreme drought led to a switch from hydro to fossil fuel power generation again. Our oceans are getting warmer and their inability to absorb this additional CO2 we should all be concerned about. Now, despite this admittedly gloomy picture, there are still some rays of light. We see the most investment into renewable energy. Recent reports suggest that it's possible that within just two years, renewable energy supplies could cost less than fossil fuel equivalents. But we are going to need to manage the risks as we transition to a low carbon renewable energy society. This will cause significant economic, geopolitical and societal risk. But these are risks we must take action on. Another risk that we need to be very aware of and manage is that relating to new technologies. As Margarita mentioned, we see significant concerns around growing inequalities as a result of advances in new technologies and high structural under or unemployment. Yet technology doesn't have to be for bad. We see plenty of examples in history where technology has been a great evolution. We see examples of drone technology where perhaps this could be used in agriculture, conservation, biodiversity management. Yet there is also the risk that short-term incentives may lead to it being used for significant harm. For example, uncontrolled use of AI piloted drones in global fishing. The key to the beneficial development of artificial intelligence will be the development of global governance norms and institutions to manage it. Global risks nowadays are so interconnected that they can threaten the very systems on which our societies, economies, and international relations are based. We have the opportunity in this era of scientific, technological, and financial resources to do something about it. If we truly care about our society, our future, and our business, we will think about everything that could impact on it. Effective risk management means taking into account interdependencies, taking a truly holistic approach, and being very aware of the cognitive biases we have in how we think and how we act. Unfortunately, we currently observe a too little too late response to climate change, and our own research suggests that the probability of hitting the Paris Agreement target is less than the probability of meeting it. But we can still meet it. It will take urgent action on policy and significant technology developments, and most importantly, a change in our sentiment and our behavior. Over the coming decades, as we transition to a new climate change environment, how we navigate that transformation is going to mean we need to do whatever is possible to support transition to renewable energy, leverage our knowledge about the risks involved, and to help society mitigate and adapt to climate change. It's not too late to build a more resilient tomorrow, but we need to take action much more urgently. Thank you. Alison, thanks very much. Um, Rick, we are a week away from what some people have uh, said is a uh, schmooze fest uh, in the Alps. Um, but actually, you're in charge of kind of ensuring that some of the stuff in this report gets turned into sessions, actions, initiatives. Can you just explain a little bit more about how this report feeds into the work that the World Economic Forum does? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thanks very much to our two uh, partners for helping us drive the, uh, the intellectual framework as well as the data behind uh, this important overview of where the world stands in respect of a number of the important flashing lights on people's radar screens. Just a word or two uh, about some of the uh, economic aspects of this, and then to the point uh, that Adrian has prompted, which is what's going to happen next week with respect to uh, action on some of these uh, problems. Uh, the one good thing I would just put a finer point on is the positive evolution overall of the world economy. The IMF, World Economic Outlook, which came out recently, has, has targeted, uh, projected about a 3.7% uh, uh, annual growth rate uh, for the year, which is uh, up from 3.2% growth in 2016. 
you can't underestimate the significance of a half a point worldwide of GDP growth for creating a greater space for exactly the kind of action and investment institutions and cooperation that, uh, that my colleagues have just uh, articulated here with respect to cyber environment and other, and other issues. That said, there are still uh, serious concerns in societies about whether that growth is translating into broad-based progress in living standards. Uh, as has been indicated by Margareta, inequality has been rising in a majority of countries over the last several years, despite the fact that we have been on a positive trajectory in terms of, of growth. But it's, it's not simply that. The ILO in its global wage report has identified paradoxically that as growth has been progressing, actually a wage and compensation levels have been uh, modestly declining. And we, in our own uh, gender gap report, uh, which we issue each year, found last year for the first time that in fact the gap is widening uh, for the first time since we've been uh, calculating uh, this index. I'd, I'd also want to just flag here uh, indebtedness. Uh, Global debt to GDP uh, ratio has been actually rising the, despite the fact that we've been climbing out of uh, a financial crisis. Uh, G20 non-financial sector debt uh, increased from 80 trillion in, 20, in 2007 to 135 trillion in 2016. Corporate debt to equity ratios have almost doubled since uh, 2010. And finally, a word on asset prices. There has been, of course, in the last several uh, weeks, a lot of focus on the stratospheric, uh, gravity-defying increase in Bitcoin uh, asset prices. But uh, whatever the particularities of that particular asset, it is a bit emblematic of asset prices more generally. And you can see it in the valuation of stock uh, market indices around the world, which have increased quite uh, considerably. And so, uh, in the U.S., for example, the cyclically, cyclically adjusted uh, uh, price ratio is at its highest level since 1929 and also uh, 2000. So we have some flashing lights even in the economic sector, despite the overall positive evolution of the macroeconomic environment. There are uh, now. Let me let me turn to the basic issue. What's what's happening on the forums platform? What do we expect to see uh, next week in respect of some of these uh, important risks? The forum. It's important to understand uh, is an international organization for the express purpose of stimulating and facilitating public-private cooperation. And as you look at cyber, you look at environment, you look at, indeed at inequality. None of these major secular risks can uh, can we see progress really improve on in the absence of a secular improvement in, in fact, public-private cooperation? And when we talk about public-private cooperation, we define private not just as the corporate sector. What we define private as non-state actors, that's to say civil society, the scientific community, academia, as, uh, as well as, indeed, uh, the private sector. And so next week, uh, 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 we are uh, planning for our annual meeting in Davos to be the focal point and the punctuation mark for a wide range of work processes that we facilitate all the way around the year on a number of these uh, dimensions. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a, a few examples in each of the primary risk areas that we've highlighted today. First on the economy, we will next week be launching a two-year uh, global dialogue on the future of economic progress. Uh, and that is intended as a, a thought process that is multidisciplinary, not just among former economic policymakers or leading macroeconomists. We, we believe that society is telling us that there needs to be some rethinking and restructuring uh, of our economic and growth model. In the global risk reports for the last couple of years, there has been a specific suggestion that there needs to be some structural improvements and reform of market capitalism to deal with some of the rumbling dissatisfaction in society about the failure of growth to diffuse as widely as it should in living standards. So we are going to be issuing a call, a clarion call, across different disciplines uh, for a dialogue and, and thought leadership in this area and a process that will be co-chaired by uh, Michael Spence, uh, Nobel laureate, 
uh, Andrew Min, uh, a leading Chinese uh, policymaker who was uh, a deputy a managing director of the IMF. So in addition, we'll be issuing uh, what I would con uh, term an alternative uh, to GDP next week. It is our Inclusive Development Index, and this uh, will uh, be uh, a response to what has been identified for many years as the need for policymakers to have a wider dashboard than simply the production of goods and services in the most recent period, which is what GDP is. If the bottom line of the way societies evaluate economic success is whether median living standards, basically people's livelihoods, and economic security improve, well, then GDP is not a sufficient uh, uh, measure of that, and we need a wider dashboard. And we will be issuing that along with a, a ranking of countries, not by the traditional GDP measure, but by this wider uh, metric. Secondly, with respect to cyber risk, uh, as John has indicated, this is really uh, rapidly emerging as a major headache in boardrooms of all sorts of institutions around the world. And uh, as he also articulated, there has been a, a, uh, a weakness in investing in the institutions, the capabilities to be able to preempt and get ahead of these risks. In response to that, the, the forum next week will be formally getting underway, formally launching a new global center for public-private cooperation on uh, uh, cybersecurity. And this will be a framework in which uh, there will be a better opportunity for uh, leaders of institutions across the public and private sectors to be able to pool their information uh, and their intelligence and their response uh, capabilities uh, to get ahead of the curve on a number of these uh, cyber risks. And this is being done in cooperation uh, with Interpol and there'll be a wide uh, number of companies and governments engaged in that, in that measure. We also have issued a, a, a cyber tool best practice guidebook, if you will, for boards of directors of various institutions, because this needs to be on the boardroom agenda uh, going forward. Then let me say a word or two about uh, the environment as well. The forum for several years has been seeking quietly uh, but very pragmatically to encourage there to be much better public-private cooperation on some of these solutions. The UN processes, including the, the uh, Paris uh, Climate Accord, has been very important in setting goals for the international uh, community. It's very important to have a universal uh, uh, direction of travel identified. But that's necessary, certainly not sufficient. And what's going to be needed is a transformation of industrial and energy systems, at least in respect of climate. And that requires some practical work on changing behaviors and improving incentives and the enabling environment for that. So uh, we have organized, uh, as a few examples, an alliance of CEO climate leaders, which now consists of 74 CEOs of companies in various uh, sectors around the world which has been uh, involved in trying to spot specific areas where the corporate community's engagement could make a meaningful difference. Most recently, the, uh, sitting here in the city of London, I should mention, the, uh, the FSB's uh, uh, recent task force, uh, in fact, we're sitting in, in Bloomberg's headquarters here, there was an industry task force created by the FSB uh, chair, Mark Carney, uh, chaired by uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, to lay out for the first time a set of a, a framework essentially for how companies should reflect in their mainstream annual reports their climate related uh, risks as well as uh, performance. And we have organized through this alliance 100 uh, CEOs who have indicated that they're prepared uh, to take this forward. Also, in, uh, in June of last year at the UN's uh, historic Ocean Summit, we and other stakeholders uh, led the way in organizing a tuna. 2020 traceability declaration involving 50 major companies, 20 NGOs, and several governments that are committed uh, for this very important uh, uh, fish uh, source of nutrition, but also important element of the health of our seas to undertake an effort to ensure that tuna is, is traced and so that we can avoid uh, tuna uh, capture which is illegal, unreported, or unregulated fishing. Similarly, on, on tropical forest, which represent 30% of the climate mitigation that is needed, 
Uh, we have a tropical forest alliance, which is engaged about 100 different partners of companies, governments, and the like, who are looking at specific jurisdictions to try to find a holistic solution to removing virgin timber from supply chains uh, of various types of, of products. And also, uh, in the last several months, we have organized a, uh, a global uh, battery alliance, which is an, an effort to try to improve the social sustainability, take child labor out of the supply chains of some of the precious metals that are required for battery production, as well as inject a recycling element so that this critical technology of the fourth industrial revolution is produced in a more sustainable uh, fashion. Uh, finally, let me say that the fourth industrial revolution is an area, a construct that the forum has attempted to ring the bell on. And when we talk about this, we're not just talking about marveling at the technologies, though they are impressive indeed. We essentially have laid out a framework which argues that there are risks that are building up in societies uh, in respect of how fast some of these technologies are developing and how they're being applied in various ways that could change our lives and that are raising different kinds of concerns, whether it has to do with privacy, whether it has to do with public safety or the like. And we have uh, created, uh, as of March of last year, and there will be announced a series of, of additional openings around the world, a worldwide center for the fourth industrial revolution, which is a framework for engaging in a discussion, a multi-stakeholder discussion, about what are the norms, the frameworks, the expectations for how these, poly these technologies should be governed governed in a small g, because in many respects you don't need hard regulation. What you need is early in the development process of a technology to be applied in a particular business model for there to be an understanding of what the social risks are and therefore what kinds of steps can be taken through standards, frameworks, best practices, or in some cases public policies to help ensure that we hardwire in those risk considerations in the technologies. And so that will be another manifestation of the way in which the forum is attempting to use its public-private cooperation platform to address some of the important risks that colleagues have identified here in this year's Global Risk Report. Thank you. Rick, thank you very much. Thanks to all our panelists. Uh, I've got time for some questions. If I could ask uh, you to pop a hand in the air and also to, uh, I know you're all famous, tell us your name and uh, your organization. That would be super handy. Uh, we have a microphone. Uh, perhaps we can go there and then there and then there and then we'll take in any questions as they pop up. Uh, Larry Elliott of The Guardian. Uh, one of the um, speakers next week at the forum is Donald Trump, the President of the United States. What could he say that would help mitigate some of the risks that you've identified today, particularly with regard to the environment and geopolitical risk? Yeah, good point. Could we take a lady down there as well? I think my question is Okay, <laughs> cool. Yes, uh, um, it's, it's just about uh, the plans to re reform market capitalism that Mr. Salmons just spoke okay. about. If, uh, uh, if, could you, I just wonder if you could broaden out what kind of reforms uh, the, the WEF would like to address as a matter of priority. I mean, obviously, one of the big issues is which um, people get exercised about uh, with Davos is the um, executive pay and you know, the divisions. There's a lot of talk about inequality, but there isn't a lot of action. You talked about some action groups that you're forming. I wondered if there's anything on that aspect of reforming market capitalism that is being addressed. Great. Um, Rick, I'll turn to you on, uh, on Philip's question, but also Obviously, in respect of uh, the President of the United States, the US is 25% of global GDP. So there's a, a whole range of things uh, that uh, the US impacts uh, the world economy and, uh, and those issues on. Um, Rick, I don't know if you want to address Philip's question and also some of the hopes regarding uh, not just President Trump, but many of the other people who are participating in the annual meeting. Yeah, on that point, uh, you know, the, the forum seeks to stimulate and inspire cooperation, international cooperation. We think there are, it's a multidimensional issue, international cooperation. It's not just an intergovernmental or, or UN approach. And I think 
uh, the U.S. remains an absolutely critical player in a wide range of the areas we're talking about here and perceives itself as such. For example, on cyber, the U.S. is acutely conscious uh, of this issue. And I think what would be uh, constructive, of course, is to hear from the, United, the new United States administration that it, it is interested, it understands that there are serious risks of the ilk that we're discussing today, and it sees that there's an important role for international cooperation, including with respect to the private sector. Uh, and that's what we're, it's not just the U.S. government, I think uh, it's, it's all stakeholders that the forum is seeking uh, to engage in a deeper level of uh, cooperation uh, to address some of the fractures which we've highlighted as the overarching theme of the annual meeting. With respect to your question on uh, the Global Risk Report, uh, a call over the last few years for some significant reform to uh, market capitalism, uh, as I indicated, uh, we have been uh, not just trying to stimulate a discussion and break it out of the classic circle of macroeconomists uh, and, and encourage a more interdisciplinary and multi-stakeholder thought process. We have been trying to stimulate that debate by uh, laying out a new policy framework uh, on inclusive growth and development. And in a word, uh, this framework, which was issued in Davos last year, and about which we'll see a, a new GDP measure laid out the next week, the, the, the anchor of this con concept, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is that we need a bit of a new North Star or compass setting, which is uh, to understand that growth is a top line measure. We're here in a business uh, uh, and financial community. Growth is critically important, but it is, if you will, in business language, a top line matter. You need it, but it isn't sufficient. The bottom line is how societies evaluate the success of their economies, which is whether living standards broadly throughout society are progressing robustly and sustainably. And we have laid out, we've identified uh, 15 different areas of institutional strength and structural policy incentives, which uh, we suggest, each of which can be a stimulus simultaneously for the level of growth and the, the extent to which it translates in, into broader progress in living standards. Uh, and we've laid out numbers for every country in this area so that countries can compare each other to see how strong their institutions and policy incentives relative to their peers are in each of these areas. And then, as I say, we'll, we'll be issuing a broader than GDP metric for evaluating countries' level of economic development as a function of how inclusive their growth model is. And this is one way, uh, in addition to some other much more uh, concrete on the ground ways, including with respect to supply chain practices around the world, uh, where we are seeking to stimulate uh, some action in this area including with respect to uh, the environmental and sustainability fields I, I mentioned earlier, trying to engage the business community to look at its business processes, to move away from looking at this as a philanthropic or corporate responsibility issue, but to see it more as a business model uh, issue. Just very briefly to bring in Alison and John, is there a willingness to engage with that, those bigger questions about market capitalism? And the report mentions them, you know, and it has mentioned them in, the, in previous years. Is the business community ready to take on some of that? Uh, so in short, yes, and I think there's, um, there's the possibility across multiple areas by trying to bring it back to sustainability. I mean, just look at responsible investing and the work that's being done there to encourage that actually long-term investors like the insurers, the pension funds, that we use our capital to encourage investment into areas like renewable energy. Um, and, and perhaps if I was going to put uh, an ask to the world leaders who are coming to the World Economic Forum, it would very much be that the current promises, the unconditional commitments given in the Paris Agreement will still lead to a 3.2 degree increase by 2100. That is a long way from the two degrees or below that we're trying to reach. We need to think about what we are going to do. 
So if, as business, we're very happy to invest in renewable energy, we think it makes sense. I think, to Rick's point, it was so important. It makes sense business. It doesn't, it's not just it makes sense because it's the right thing to do, but actually economically it does. As I said earlier, reports suggest that renewable energy will be cheaper than fossil fuels in just a couple of years. This makes economic sense for us to do. John? And I would just underscore an, a different point that Rick made, which is um, that it would be great to see a constructive multi-stakeholder dialogue on some of these complex issues which require that type of cooperation to solve. So whether climate or cyber, these are, these are boundaryless risks. I mean, just looking at cyber, I mean, looking at it from a company perspective, you know that you can be affected by the risk through your vendors, through your customers, through a lot of different ways. So your own security depends on the security of others. Taking that to a global scale, it's really the same issue. So I think looking ahead to the forum, it would be great to see both the public-private sector cooperation, but also multilateral cooperation across uh, different countries uh, to try to address these issues. Okay. I turn over to <clears throat> a neglected corner of the room. Sorry, gentlemen over there. And then some questions down at the front. Sorry, sending you from side to side. Yeah, Bernard from the Insurance Insider. Um, question for John and Alison. How much of these risks are insurable, especially on the cyber side? You mentioned the impact of knocking out one data center would be the equivalent of a hurricane. What, uh, what can you do as an insurance industry to mitigate against that? Is that something that we can insure against? Um, obviously, we've got cyber insurance already, but it's, it's a quite a small scale compared to what's actually needed. What, what do you guys need to do? Great question. I'm just going to squeeze in the three folks at the front here as well. Ivan Kutasova from CNN. Um, a follow-up on President Trump. Um, I mean, the, the message from Davos that we get every year is more cooperation, more um, confidence in collective security alliance, more action on the environment. His message in the first year was pretty decisively against all these things. So are you expecting him to continue that message or are you hoping that putting him in that environment where everyone is saying pretty much this, the same things will change his opinions? Or what What would you like him to, to do on that stage? I think you both asked and answered your own question there. Um, <laughs> just the two gentlemen there as well. Thank you. Uh, Tim Wallace at The Telegraph. Uh, when you're coming up with these solutions to reforming capitalism, do you, do you think you'll have much weight globally, given ordinary voters are rejecting the current model? Are they going to listen to a group of millionaires getting together in Davos and coming up with answers on their behalf. Um, you talked about the risk of populism. Uh, Labour's uh, current leadership obviously has some very strongly anti-capitalist rhetoric at the moment. Do you see Labour as a risk um, and uh, do you hope to persuade John McDonnell to change his stance? Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's interesting that you say uh, a group of, uh, of millionaires gathering in Davos. When you try and have a multi-stakeholder approach, which is what you've been hearing from here, people like uh, Telegraph columnist Jeremy Warner are part of that multi-stakeholder group of people. So we very much hope that uh, the voice of uh, some media outlets will be heard amongst that group. I mean, it, the idea is that Davos brings together diverse and uh, concerned individuals, be they from NGOs, be they from trade unions like our co-chair Sharon Burrow, be they social entrepreneurs like Chana Sinha in India, who runs a huge fund that helps women in the most deprived areas of India to get a leg up. All of those kind of voices are injected into the conversation at Davos. So if you look at the actual percentage of NGOs, academics, and other people, it's something like 55, 60% of participants in Davos. So those are the voices that counterweight some of the business voices. And I'm sure as you'll hear from uh, both Alison and John, not all of those business voices are those of millionaires. They're also of CEOs and people running big social enterprises. Uh, so I think all of that will be on our agenda. And I'll let the folks here speak a bit more to it. Um, on the insurance issue, just to bring in both Alison and, and John, how insurable are those big risks that uh, you referred to? So let me, let me touch on cyber. Um, you know, I, I think as you point out, the cyber insurance market is small in relation to the risk. I'd say it has been growing. It's about uh, sort of three, three and a half billion dollars of uh, premium today. So it covers a few hundred billion dollars of, of risk. But uh, the, uh, the, and the market's been growing in three different uh, dimensions. I mean, it's been expanded. It primarily was a US data breach market uh, a couple of years back. 
Uh, so covering uh, sort of that type of risk, I think it's been expanding in terms of the coverage of risk. So more uh, what we call first party risk or property damage, business interruption, sort of critical infrastructure uh, uh, can be covered now in the markets. Uh, limits have been growing. Uh, individual companies can get up to a billion dollars of cover uh, now in the, in the market. And I think it's been growing in internationally. So we see our fastest growing uh, uh, cyber insurance areas being outside the U.S. now, although the U.S. market is still quite robust in growth. But you're right to point out that even with all of that growth and the projected growth to be about $10 billion of premium by 2020, it's still uh, relatively small scale in comparison to the risk and small scale in comparison to the property insurance market. So I think lots of uh, uh, demand is out there. I think uh, the insurance companies are starting to respond with capacity, uh, but I think there's a lot, long way to go. Alison? And maybe I'd just add to that, I very much agree with John. I think the, the, the thing which I think the insurance industry can really add value here is in risk assessment. If you think, what is our business? Our business is risk. We need to understand it. So we need to understand where people are exposed. We need to be able to get data. We need to be able to model it, to be able to price it. So in through doing a risk assessment service, that I think is where the insurance industry can actually start to add even more value than just the exposure protection in of itself. Uh, and just, James, to your point, uh, the changes in market capitalism that you heard Rick talk about are changes that affect not just the UK, but uh, almost all advanced and emerging economies. And those are things that you see reflected in politics right across the world. There's going to be some 340 political governmental leaders in Davos, and they're all grappling with a lot of these issues. And what we hope is that we've got some of the resources to add to their decision-making process. Rick, do you want to just come well, in just, on? Just to add a little bit of context here. About 60, 65% of the participants in the forum's annual meeting are from the business community. So that means you've got over a thousand, about a thousand or so uh, people who are uh, from governments. We've got 70 heads of government coming this year. So you've got, we've got about 160 or 70 uh, people under the age of 40 who are leaders in various domains uh, of their field. We've got 70 plus heads of civil society organizations, that is to say uh, non-governmental organizations, labor union heads, and indeed uh, faith-based leaders, religious leaders, if you will. So the, the, the caricature of, of the form is basically a, a, you know, the global rich coming together is a character. It's, it's just not, doesn't recognize the fact that this is essentially the world summit uh, of multi-sector, multi multi-stakeholder leaders of various kinds of, of institutions coming together. Then in, in respect of the questions regarding the United States, I think, I think most people would recognize, and indeed uh, people of various countries, that there is nothing inherently in contradiction between national interests on the one hand and the pursuit of cooperation with other countries on the other. Much of the progress in the world that we've seen over the last uh, century is understanding, in fact, and, and acting upon the intersection of national interest and international cooperation. And that is, in effect, I think, what is going to be very interesting about the discussions next week is in finding those areas. It's not just the United States, but many countries of where, and helping to have, through dialogue, a trust-enhancing dialogue, a, a widening understanding uh, of various stakeholders and people from various countries, where their national interests, and their, even indeed their community interests, can be furthered by not shouldering all the responsibility by themselves, but trying to find coalitions uh, and, uh, and communities that, of interest that will want to work together on issues. Lastly, on the labor uh, issue. Uh, we, uh, we agree with the premise of the question that uh, the, and in fact the Global Risk Reports in, indicated that one of the signaled new flashing lights is has identified by our sample of, of respondents is the growing concern about the intersection of technology on the one hand and structural challenges to employment and livelihoods on the other. And uh, we have a major institutional effort underway uh, called our System Initiative on Education, Gender, and Work that through a, ver a variety of different interventions is trying to take a look at the whole life cycle 
of skills development, of human capital formation, if you want to put it in, in that, those kinds of business terminology, where uh, technology and integration of markets and migration and other uh, disruptions impel countries to, to make structural modernizations of their enabling our environment for skills development and acquisition in their populations. And we have an initiative, for example, on the action side, which has set a target of uh, 5 million uh, uh, young people uh, trained over the next couple of years uh, through public-private partnership. And we're well on our way toward meeting uh, that target. But this is not the whole solution, but it's, it's the kind of thing where, uh, to my earlier point, you really need some degree of cross-sectoral Cross industry, but also public private cooperation to try to do right uh, by our workforce. Rick, thanks very much. Uh, just a quick sense is there anyone who feels they've got something? It's probably going to be a sort of yes no style answer. Gentleman there, and uh, I think I saw a hand go up just there. Yeah, great. <clears throat> just behind. Just in terms of regional differences, is Asia any more exposed? Sorry, who, can you just tell us who you are and where oh, you're sorry. from? Sorry, Paul Barber from Channel News Asia. In terms of regional differences, is Asia any more exposed to these risk factors than others? Okay, and gentlemen, just there. Just on the end, keep your hand up and we can see you for the microphone. Fantastic. Uh, and there's one more question over there. And we can... Uh, uh, just in terms of participation, um, just tell us your sorry, name and Damien McElroy from the National. The, from the um, from the National. National, thanks. Um, in terms of, we see you say seventy world leaders coming. Is there a Trump factor there in that people really want to get their messages, as well as his messages? And then just on that regional engagement issue, what is there a large increase in regions like the Middle East who are coming, and what are they getting out of it? Okay, there's a kind of suite of questions, probably. Uh, just lady there. Sanavas, Global Trade Review. Um, in the report, you have a section about future shocks, and one of them talks about the death of trade and the risk of a breakdown in the global trade system. What could trigger such a scenario, and what can business businesses do to mitigate the risks that are connected to this warning. Okay, thanks very much. Margreta, I'm just going to turn to you on, on those couple of things, yep. um, on trade and also maybe on the regional yes. um, aspects of it. Uh, and uh, I would just say, uh, just uh, Damien, I mean, I think everyone is interested in, in listening to uh, all of the folks who are going to be, be speaking. Um, you can see from the uh, the advanced booking uh, system we have already that almost all our sessions are, are filling up and are overbooked. So I think I don't think there'll be any uh, fear of people not being heard. Um, Margareta, can I just turn? Sure. On the maybe on the Asia question first, and on the regional generally the regional split of risks. So first of all, we, we don't see any region that is more exposed to risks than other, and we and we don't really measure it that way, but we measure which risks each region is exposed to. So there, is, uh, there are significant regional differences. Um, and actually, we even have country-level data. If you go on the website, there's country-level data from a business perspective about the risks each country is, exp uh, is exposed to. Uh, from a regional level, uh, Asia more exposed to geopolitical risks and natural catastrophes than other regions. Latin America is more on the governance side. So the societal risks very strong in Latin America. Europe is traditionally very strong on economic risks. So there are significant regional differences that we see that paint a very interesting picture. And also at the country level, there are significant differences. Um, then maybe on the death of trade. So first of all, those future shocks, it's the new feature that we introduced uh, this year, and that are future scenarios. So that paint a what if type of story, what could, what could happen if something, uh, what, what type of um, Structural impact could happen if we had uh, if we had uh, from, it could happen from a fairly small development. I think some of the political evol developments that we have seen, if countries really continue closing down and con and and if we do not find this balance that Rick was talking about earlier between national interest and international interest and how we how we uh, distributed this balance interna internationally, then it really it may really. Uh, 
happen that we, you know, come, it just comes to that we have a breakdown of the multilateral trading system, and that um, the institutions are weakened over time, and that those uh, those structures that we've been re relying on and the international institutions that we've been re relying on do not work the way they have uh, they have been working in the past. They rely very strongly on on the WTO structures, on the appellate body. They they have a a, a lot of the WTO has a lot of functions that it plays in order to keep it up. So if uh, this institution is weakened, then we could really see a, a breakdown of the trading system. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, the big hand has passed the uh, the twelve. So I'm going to say a big thank you to all of our panelists and to you for being here. Uh, if you've got any further questions, uh, each of them be happy to stay on and uh, discuss them individually. Uh, there's more information at www.weforum.org. You can find all of that info that Margareta referred to. And uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you.